Hello and welcome once again to our series on life's big questions. And in particular, is the Bible a message from a God I can't see? Well, we have looked at a number of different subjects, but tonight we want to open up the pages of the Bible and consider how the Bible is proved to be correct through the work of archaeology. Now, archaeological uh, discoveries are like buried treasure. Most fascinating artefacts have been found, some of which have ended up in national museums. Often inscriptions and writings are even more exciting because they refer to people and places in history. It is only in the last 200 years or so that archaeology has had any real relevance to the Bible. And before that time, many of the places and people found in the Bible were not even mentioned anywhere else. And so the critics said that the Bible was a myth, was made of myth and legend. Uh, and of course, that cry still happens today where people say it's, it's full of rubbish, it's just fairy stories, there's no basis to it. But in the last 200 years, names from the Bible have leapt to life with the discovery of palace walls, stones and coins displaying biblical names and records of biblical events. Before we look at the discoveries, we shall very briefly give the geography and history behind the discoveries to enable you to see their background. We shall look at the discoveries in chronological order as they relate to the Bible. Well, a little bit of background history. The Bible is mainly concerned with the nation of Israel and its neighbours. In the provided notes, uh, which are easily downloadable from our website, which accompany this seminar, is a timeline for Israel relating to the period of the archaeological discoveries we will look at. As the oldest discovery refers to King David, we shall start our timeline there. Many of the discoveries relate to the superpowers that dominated the nation of Israel. For instance, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. Each of these superpowers conquered the previous one, and Israel usually suffered as a result. Let's consider some archaeological discoveries. The Tel Dan inscription. Now, the critical scholars used to doubt that King David mentioned in the Bible ever existed, but they were forced to reconsider their opinions in 19, as early as, or as late as 1993 when part of a 3,000-year-old inscription was found at Tel Dan, as we saw in the map reference there, in northern Israel. A second part was subsequently found in 1994. The fragments were part of a wall and are inscribed in a Middle Eastern language known as Aramaic. Although much of the text is missing, you can see the points that are made in the uh, engraving itself. Firstly, Hadad made the writer king. We learn that the writer is boasting of his military achievements involving the king of Israel, and the writer mentions the house of David. And the Bible talks several times of war between Israel and Syria, and mentions the Syrian kings who had the title Ben-Hadad, which means son of Hadad. In 1 Kings 20 in verse 1, we read, Now Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his forces together, and he went up and besieged Samaria and made war against it. Again, in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 3, we read that then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of of Haziel, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, all their days. 
So the tensions between the Israelites and the Syrians was obviously a reoccurring problem. The Bible records both Israel and Syria being victorious on different occasions. And the Tel Dan inscription probably refers to one of the Syrian victories. Now, there are many references in the Bible to the house of David, meaning the kings who were David's descendants. But here are two. In 1 Kings 12, verse 26, we read, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. Again, in 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 19, he says, So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And so what we can tell from the inscription or that were found in the Tal Dan uh, engravings or wall engravings confirm the Bible record that one, there was hostility between Syria and Israel, that Ben means son of, Hadad was a title of Syrian kings involved in this hostility, and that the royal line from King David was known as the House of David. Well, let's consider another relic. This is the Kirk a stella of Shalmaneser III. Now, this round top vertical slab, or what they call a stella, was found at Kirk, uh, spelt with, with a K-U-R-K-H, as we see on the screen, in Turkey in 1861. It shows the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III facing the symbols of four gods. Across the front and back of the stella are the 102 lines of writing recording the main events of his first six military campaigns. Included in the record of those defeated by the Assyrians are the names of Ahab, king of Israel, and Ben-Hadad, king of Syria. The Bible tells us of a time when there was a league between Ahab and Ben-Hadad. In 1 Kings 20, verse 34, we read that, So Ben-Hadad said to him, The cities which my father took from your father I will restore, and you may set up marketplaces for yourself in Damascus, as my father did in Samaria. Then Ahab said, I will send you away with this treaty. So he made a treaty with him and sent him away. The Stella confirms the Bible record that Ahab and Ben-Hadad were ruling at the same time. Assyrian records also exist, which mention the following Bible kings. Hezekiah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekah, Hoshea, Uzziah, Azad, Ahaz, and Hazael. And so the, key, the Kirk Stella confirms the Bible record that Ahab was king of Israel. Ben-Hadad was king of Syria at the same time, and other Assyrian records mention eight other kings referred to in the Bible. Let us consider another one, the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. Same king, another relic. And this large black stone was one of the most exciting discoveries in history. It was found in a pit at the ancient uh, Assyrian city of Kala in 1846. But amazingly, archaeologists almost missed it. The dig was about to be closed down. It was winter. The ground was difficult to dig and not much had been found. And it was agreed to dig for just one more day. And early on that last morning, the workmen struck a huge stone that has become one of the most important finds relating to the Bible. The stone has five panels of carved pictures on each of its four sides. Each panel has an inscription. On one side, the second panel from the top shows the Jewish king Jehu bowing before Shalmaneser III, bringing tribute to him. And the description directly above the panel says, the tribute of Jehu the Israelite 
silver, gold, a golden bowl, a golden vase, golden tumblers, golden buckets, tin, a staff for a king, and hunting spears I received. As you can see, Jehu is pictured with a short, rounded beard, a sleeveless jacket, a long fringed skirt, a belt and a soft cap. This is the earliest depiction of an Israelite. And the Bible tells us of some of the exploits of Jehu in 2 Kings chapters 9 and 10. The Shalmaneser was the name of several kings of Assyria, and we meet one of them later on in the Bible. In 2 Kings 17 verse 3, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. We read of Hoshea, a later king of Israel, he paid tribute in the same way as Jehu, who is shown on the obelisk. And so the black obelisk confirms the Bible record that Israel had a king named Jehu, that Jehu reigned in the period when Assyria was a superpower. And the Assyrians had kings named Shalmaneser. The Assyrians made subject nations pay tribute. Now, our next archaeological find is called the six-sided Sennacherib Cylinder. This is a six-sided clay prism found at Nineveh, near to Khorsabad. It is inscribed with an account of eight military campaigns of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And the most interesting part of the record says, I then besieged Hezekiah of Judah, who had not submitted to any yoke, and I captured 46 of his strong cities and fortresses, innumerable small cities. I brought out there, therefrom 200,150 people. Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up within Jerusalem, his royal city. I threw up mounds against him. I took vengeance upon any man who came forth from his city. Now, the record, interestingly, uh, interestingly, does not claim that Jerusalem, the capital city, was taken. And the Bible account tells us why. In the book of Second Kings, we read, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then the king of Assyria went to Tartan, the Rabsaris and the Rabshaka of, from Lachish with a great army against Jerusalem to Hezekiah. But the Bible, the honest history book, reveals why Sennacherib avoids mentioning Jerusalem. 2 Kings 19 verses 35 and 36 tell us that it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. Such an embarrassing defeat is not likely to have been mentioned by Sennacherib. In fact, the Sennacherib cylinder now confirms that the Bible record that Sennacherib conquered all the fortified cities in Judah, but Sennacherib failed to take Jerusalem. Now, there is another clay cylinder written this time by Cyrus, king of Persia. Uh, and this uh, cylinder was found at Babylon. And the cylinder contains an account of the conquest of the city of Babylon by Cyrus. And the cylinder spells out Persian policy towards captive people, such as the Israelites and their sacred ritual objects. I return to these sacred cities on the other side of the Tigris, the sanctuaries of which have been in ruins for a long time, the images which used to live therein and establish for them permanent sanctuaries. I also gathered all their former inhabitants and returned to them their habitation. And the Babylonians had captured all the sacred objects from the Jerusalem temple. 
and these would have passed into the hands of the Persians when they overthrew the Babylonian Empire. Now, we read in the book of Ezra of the policy outlined in the Cyrus Cylinder being put into practice. In Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 3, we read, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. So the Cyrus cylinder confirms the Bible record. Cyrus allowed people to go back to their own cities and practice their own religion. Of course, that was providing they continued to make their tribute to him. There is another uh, block of limestone uh, that was uncovered called the Pilate Inscription. Not long ago, many scholars were questioning the existence of a Roman governor with the name Pontius Pilate, the Roman official who ordered Jesus' crucifixion. In June 1961, Italian archaeologists led by Dr. Frova were excavating an ancient Roman amphitheatre near Caesarea on the Sea Mar Maritima and uncovered this interesting limestone block. On the face is a monumental inscription, part of a larger dedication to Tiberius Caesar. It says, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. Of course, this agrees perfectly with what we read in the Bible. In Luke chapter 3, verse 1, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. And so the Pilate inscription supports the Bible. Pontius Pilate was governor or prefect of Judah in the reign of Emperor Tiberius Caesar. In the past, some scholars said that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was an inaccurate and unreliable historian. His inconsistent use of official titles showed that he either did not know what he was writing about or perhaps just couldn't be bothered to do the research. For example, Luke's use of the word polytarch occurred uh, nowhere else in Greek literature and Luke must have got it wrong. But recent discoveries show that the local rulers and officials had different titles in different places. Our picture shows a Greek inscription discovered in 1835 on an arch in Thessalonica, which lists the officials in the town in the second century AD. It begins by listing six polytarchs. Since then, the same term has been found on other inscriptions in Thessalonica, and this agrees with Luke's account of problems in Thessalonica, as recorded in Acts chapter 17, verses 6 to 8, where we read, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers, uh, polytax in Greek, if you have a look at the Greek word for rulers, uh, they dragged them to the rulers of the city, crying out, Though these who have turned the world upside down have come here too, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And so in both cases, the word rulers is that word polytarch that he uses. Other examples of Luke's correct use of titles for rulers are praetors, being rulers of Philippi, proconsul, the ruler of Corinth, and leading man of the island, the ruler of Malta. And so the writer of the book of Acts used accurate titles for government officials throughout Europe. So in summary, we can see that archaeology has supported the Bible's statements. As we read that there were periods of hostility between Syria and Israel, that Ben-Hadad was a, a Syrian king, involved in this uh, history, and that uh, can be seen from 1 Kings 20 and 2 Kings chapter 13. 
but also the kings of Israel were referred to as the house of David, as referred to in 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 19. Not only that, that Mesha, king of Moab, was for a time under tribute to Israel and subsequently rebelled. And Omri was one of the kings of Israel, which is all that's recorded in 1 Kings 16 and 2 Kings chapters 3 and 4. And we saw in 1 Kings 20 that Ahab was one of the uh, of Israel's kings at the time at one and at one time he had an alliance with Ben Hadad. All of these supported not only by the Bible but by archaeological proof. Uh, Israel had a king named Jehu who reigned when Assyria was a superpower, and the Assyrians had a king called Shalmaneser who made subject uh, nations pay tribute again confirmed by the Bible in 2 Kings 9 and 10 and 2 Kings 17 and through uh, archaeological finds. Also, the king of Assyria conquered Samaria and took its inhabitants captive. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, conquered all the cities of Judah except Jerusalem, which he failed to conquer. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered Jerusalem and took tribute. And the king was then taken captive and another king put in his place as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 24 and confirmed through archaeological finds. Daniel 5, Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. He was second in command under his father. And that was, we saw, uh, wonderfully confirmed through archaeology. Assyria had kings called Shalmaneser, Sargon, Sennacherib, and Ezaraden. And Babylon had a king called Nebuchadnezzar. Persia had a king called Cyrus. All of these confirmed through the, uh, the finding of archaeological uh, valuable relics. And also, we saw remarkably how the king of, uh, of Persia, Cyrus, allowed the people taken captive by the Babylonians to go back to their own lands and practice their own religions, as Ezra confirms in Ezra chapter 1, and of course is confirmed through archaeological. We saw in from Luke chapter 3 verse 1 uh, and from uh, a limestone block that uh, Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. He wasn't a fig figment of the writer's imagination. And finally, the terms used uh, in the writing of the Acts of the Apostles in concerning the, uh, the rulers and, and their titles is accurate. And that, is, that was proved through the discoveries of archaeology. And so we have seen that the Bible is accurate when it records information about people and places that it talks about. Now, we've only looked at some archaeological discoveries involving inscriptions, but there have been many more discoveries that support the Bible record in other ways, and they are be, being found even daily uh, in, as, as the digs go on around the world even now. And you have to, so the challenge then becomes to you uh, that you now have to answer the challenges posed by the evidence of a power greater than yourselves. The first challenge is where can we find so much evidence of a power greater and wiser than us? The section has shown that the Bible is accurate in its information about people and places, despite the assertions of critics in the past and of loud voices in the present that it's a book of fairy tales. It's not. It's a book of history. And it's a very special history. And so we can ask the question, what is special about the Bible? And we are going to get to those sections and we will tell of those uh, in the near future. The Bible is 100% accurate. It's clear and direct predictions about nations and cities. It's consistent message written by people from vastly different cultures and times. And, there, and a law a thousand years ahead of its time as we have seen in past classes. The second challenge then is 
to find out what this accurate and reliable source of information has to say about your future. It is 100% correct about other issues. You can trust its statements about your life. Our aim is to help you see the Bible message for yourself, not just accept what we or anyone else might have to say about it. We urge you to look further into the matter and we invite you to come back and uh, we, as we open up our class and, and, uh, and now discuss what we have, we've spoken about, that don't forget that there is another class in, uh, in two weeks' time, God willing, and you are all, in, all invited. Thank you. Thank you.